that if you're not slightly embarrassed by who you were 10 years ago, you're not growing. And, and, and I think about that. I think about that, that often, cause that's had a lot, that's had a big impact because it's, um, I, I want to continue to be a better version of myself and, and whether that's a, a better father, a better husband, a, a better investor, like whatever it might be. Um, I think it's important to have that growth mindset. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Moeller Real Estate and Business Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Moeller, and on this podcast, we will be interviewing guests that have made their mark in real estate, in business, and in other areas of life. Listening to podcasts myself has helped me in so many different ways and continues to do so. If you're a real estate investor or an entrepreneur or aspiring to be either, or just someone that wants to learn, you've come to the right place. An easy way to have an impact is to share this episode with friends or family, provide a review, or just spread the word. We greatly appreciate it. And now let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Muller Real Estate and Business Podcast. I'm very happy to have our guest this week, Gabriel Hamill. Gabriel, how are you doing today? I am doing amazing. Thanks for having me. For our listeners, so first, Gabriel, Army National Guard and military veteran and did combat in the Middle East. So thank you for your service. We appreciate that. Um, Absolutely. Real estate investor in multifamily and mobile home, primarily with over $60 million in assets, also does some industrial and some other asset classes. So we'll talk about that. Author. Of a book here, I have it. If you're on the video, but zero to 100 units, and really just a great all-around guy from a personal perspective. Uh, Gabriel and I have met um, a couple different times, and he, I called him, I think in January, just to ask for some guidance on seller financing and maybe how we might structure a deal. And he was very generous with his time to me personally. So thank you for that. So Gabriel, let's get into it here. Tell us just a little bit about your backstory at a high level, and then we'll pick pick and choose where to dive in a little bit more. Yeah, it's 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 a long story. So just just cut me off whenever whenever you want. But I, I I'm happy to share. So you know, going back, I was really the the kid in school that never really connected the dots of like why and and how are what they how are what they teach me in class really relate to the real world, you know. And I I remember even asking teachers that at a young age, like, you know, how am I going to use this stuff in the real world? And I teachers never really had a good answer for me. I was oftentimes just like daydreaming and, and thinking about everything else and having no idea what the teachers were, were talking about. Um, that, that kind of followed me into like middle school and high school. Uh, and, and really what kept me, I think in high school was, was wrestling. High school wrestling was a huge part of my life. Yeah. The social aspect of school was important to me. I've always liked, I like people. And so outside of uh, high school wrestling and the social aspect, I don't know that I would have stayed in school. Um, again, it came back to that, like, gosh, I just, I just don't see what they're teaching me. First of all, it just wasn't, uh, the subjects weren't of interest, but I also, I saw a lot of adults in, in my life and around my life that had these full-time jobs. Most of the time they hated them. A lot of times they were low paying jobs. And I was like, there's gotta be more, there's gotta be more to that than just that like hamster wheel of 40 plus hours a week, working a job, coming home and doing it again every day. And, and that was just not attractive to me, but I didn't know really what other options there were. Was um, that, I mean, what age was like, did you start recognizing that like at a really young age, like just the, the social and the awareness to see that? Yeah. At, at a pretty young age. I mean, like I, I had amazing parents. I, I, you know, I grew up lower middle class. I never, I never went without like my parents were uh, very loving, kind people, but they also both worked, you know, jobs, you know, a, a, enough to get by. Um, and I just thought, gosh, this doesn't, th there's gotta be more. And, you know, I wanted more. So they said, hey, go find a job. So at like 12 years old, I went and got a paper out and I was up, you know, every morning, you know, doing my paper out from 12 to 16. I, sold candy bars out of my locker in middle school. I tried to sell condoms out of my locker in high school. Oh boy. Um, the school shut that down, you know, pretty quick, but I think kind of always that like entrepreneurial spirit um, yep. and, and kind of knowing there's another way, but not really knowing how to, how to exercise that. Uh, then my senior year of high school, I ended up joining the army national guard and infantry unit. I had a friend of mine, say, Hey, army national guard, it's one week in a month, two weeks a year. So, I mean, he sounded just like the commercial, right? So at, at 17 years, at 17 years old, I signed up, the recruiter would pick us up in the Humvee at lunch, take us to lunch. We'd go down to the armory. We had, you know, we'd shoot rifles that were attached to basically at the time, like a, a big video game. So like 
you know, in the in the late '90s, to be able to you know to shoot a rifle with blanks in it to uh, basically on a big video game screen, I'm like, this is amazing. Yep. One week in a month, sign up for six years. It pays for college, which I, I never really went to, um, <laughs> but but it sounded great, right? And you know the. The Army National Guard, the infantry unit in Oregon hadn't been deployed since World War II. Obviously, when you sign up, you know it's it's a possibility. So I joined in 99. I graduated in high school in 2000 and just took a bunch of odd and end jobs um, throughout those first couple of years. And I took a couple of classes at the community college, but instantly knew like this is like I think like a semester, um, not my thing. And then sometime in there, probably around two, I think it's around 2002, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And... I read that book and I'm, it's, it's the first book. I, I used to be embarrassed to say it. Now I'm like proud to say it. It's the first book I ever read word for word, cover to cover. So I got all the way through school without reading the book. Um, but I, I read that book and it was the first book I couldn't put down the first, the first thing, the first book that I was interested in. And, you know, up until that point, I would have said, I don't like learning. I don't like education. But what I found is I just hadn't found something that I enjoyed learning about something that engaged me, something that excited me. So I read that book and I'm like, Oh my gosh, this makes sense. It answers all these questions that I didn't even know I, I had. And it explained, you know, it's not a how to book, but it definitely gives you kind of a framework and a mindset around, Hey, there's something different outside the status quo of like, go to school, go to more school, go to more school, get a job, work for the rest of your life and retire when you're too old to enjoy life. And so that was kind of the first spark of like, okay, I'm going to be financially free through real estate this will be my path to building wealth. This is my path to financial freedom. And this is my path to live a life differently than how most people live their life. And I want to stay there because in the book you talk about, there was a section that says, I want to unlearn everything that society has taught us and, and really just do the opposite. So and I, when I think about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I, re I remember reading that probably a similar time frame and thinking, why hasn't anyone told me this? This is so different than what I've mm -hmm. heard my entire life. So it's just very different is, so I, my question for you is this kind of unlearn what society has taught us. Is this, is this a business principle or is this a broader principle in your mind? Yeah, it definitely brought a uh, broader principle really around just questioning, questioning things. You know, I, my, my mom and dad always taught me to, to question things. And I think I would do that almost to, to the extreme, right? Like anytime I saw the majority and this is like in any area of life, Anytime I see the majority of people doing something, it like it almost naturally, instinctually, I question that, right? Yep. And um, I, I think it's a good thing. Like now, maybe I'll come to the conclusion that like you know what the society's doing as a whole is is maybe a, a good thing. But I can't help almost at this point, but at least question what the masses are doing and put a little a, a put a little thought into that. So yeah, at a young age, you know, when I see um, you know the majority of people like not working out. Well, I'm going to work out even harder. Like when I see the majority of people having jobs that they, that they don't like, I'm like, gosh, that can't, that can't be the only way. Like there's people that have to be, you know, enjoying life to, to an extreme. Like what are the other, what are the other options? And with questioning things, I've naturally been able to find answers that, and it's not so much about a right or wrong. Like I, I don't care if someone wants to work a W2 job and they love it. And it brings them joy, but it's, it's more so for those, you know, if, if you hate your job and you're still going and you've never questioned, like, why am I doing this thing? Or, you know, those that are going to college just because mom and dad told them that they should, or their teachers told them that they should, or their friends tell them they should without ever questioning that that's, those are the areas where it's like, I naturally have to question that. Why, like, why do I have to do that? Do I have to do that? Is there another way? Is there another path? And, and ultimately I believe I can choose my own path. Yep. So a couple of things there. First, I think curiosity is such a great trait to have, to, to not build just your awareness of why people do things. But I think through that process, you can really strengthen your own self-awareness of what you, who you are, what your beliefs are. So I love how you talked about that. The second thing is you just talked about, you, you kind of hinted on this and you talk about risks and your perception of risks. And you talk about this in the book is, what is the risk of the current path? Tell me more about how that friend, and maybe, maybe we even bring that back to, okay, you were talking about rich dad, poor dad, what was next next? And how were you thinking about the risks when you were pivoting here? Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love that question. Uh, yeah. Just kind of real life example. When I think of risk, for instance, 
in um in 2009 is when i bought my first seller finance deal and so kind of going back to kind of my early my early story um i get deployed and, and I'll, I'll kind of get to this, but leading up, I get deployed in 03. got a phone call five days later, I'm gone, you know, and I have this dream. I just read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'm living in a friend's attic for a hundred dollars a month and I get deployed. Well, I still had this dream. And, and my goal over there was, Hey, I'm going to come back alive. I'm not going to come back, not too messed up. And I'm going to come back and, you know, start, start buying real estate. And my friends are laughing at me going, you live in an attic for a hundred dollars a month. <laughs> you didn't go to college. You're, you're an idiot. How are you going to do this? And I'm like, I, I don't know, but I read this book and people do it. And, you know, you can be financially free. And I'm like, I'm going to be young and rich. And I'm telling everybody and I'm like, yeah, good, good luck, buddy. It sounds great. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, sounds good. And I, and I didn't know how, but I just knew like, and some of that's mindset. Like I just, I just knew that I would. Um, and so I get deployed 03 and 04 and I come back in 04, I get completely out of the military in 05, uh, but I start looking for properties. Well, if you remember 2005, anyone can get a loan. And so in 2005, I go to the bank, no money, no job, no down payment, 100% financing. They give me a loan. I house hacked it. I rented out. I didn't even know the term house hacking. It just made good sense back then. Rented out two of the rooms, lived in the other room for less than I could anywhere else. So I buy a house in 05, another one in 06, another one in 07, all no money down bank financing. And I'm thinking like, this is this is easier than the books. Like, <laughs> why, why wouldn't everyone just go to the bank? Like I have no job and no income and they're giving me a, they're giving me a loan and I would move out of one, move to the other. And I thought I'll just do this every year, uh, you know, real easy. And then when 2008 rolled around and I went back to the bank, they said, you don't qualify. And I'm saying, what do you mean? I don't qualify. I, you know, I've, I've purchased, I've purchased homes for the last three years. I've made payments on time every month. Um, there was on the two properties that were now rentals, they cash flowed a little bit. Um, they're like, sorry, you need a job, you need a down payment, you need income. Like you just don't, don't qualify. Uh, and so I knew there had to be another way. I, I briefly remember hearing about private money, hard money and seller financing. I knew nobody with private. I knew, I knew no one with money. I knew no one in business. I knew no one in real estate. And, and I thought hard money was only for flippers at the time. And I wasn't flipping homes. I wanted to buy and hold cash flow real estate. So I spent the next I spent the next year on Craigslist every night looking for seller finance deals, and I I had a lot of conversations, a lot of calls. I was analyzing deals, a lot of offers, a lot of offers that got that got laughed at, that got rejected, got, got hung up on. But it was just kind of building that uh, building that muscle. And when I think about when I think about risk, kind of going back to your your question, I was working a minimum wage job, thirty hours a week minimum wage job by this time in a high school special special education class, and so. I found two duplexes on Craigslist side by side for four, uh, four units. And keep in mind, I had looked and offered on deals and had conversations for almost a year. So when, when I came across this, like I knew it was a good deal. I'm running my numbers going, what am I missing? What am I missing? What, yep. you know, I got to pull the trigger. It was a no money down seller finance deal. My only criteria back then it had to be cash flow positive. Cause if I put no money down, it's an infinite return. Yeah. So right, if, if, infinite return. And, um, it cash flowed almost to the dollar I was making at my job. And when I when I started telling people that I was going to buy this, everyone told me it was risky. So going back to your question, everyone yeah. said it's so risky. And now 2009 people are worried because we're coming out of the, you know, the 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 recession, they're like, "Well, what if prices go down?" And I look at risk because not only did I buy that, for the next couple of months I kept buying more multifamily properties, all no money down seller financing on on small multifamilies. And I had a lot of people saying, "Isn't that risky?" What if the tenants move out? What if, and I didn't I didn't have a, a bunch of reserves. I actually had almost no reserves. And um, you know, what if tenants move out? What if the prices go down? And I remember saying like, I don't care if prices go down as long as they're ca they, they're cash flow positive. Right. And the, I'd always get told, isn't it risky? It, even my parents who are very supportive and friends that have all been supportive, isn't that risky? That seems risky. But to me, the risk was not buying the deal because worst case scenario. Keep in mind, I was working 30 hours a week at a minimum wage job. So what was my worst, what was my worst case scenario? The the upside of doing those deals were way greater than the downside of all the what ifs that could happen in real estate. No. I looked at all the what ifs as way less risky than just pulling the trigger and buying the deal. And that one decision led to, you know, the next several years of buying real estate and more real estate and more cash flow in real estate. And that was really the the beginning of my journey to to building wealth and owning assets and and having cash flow. And I think that, you know, for a lot of people, if they're thinking about whether it's real estate, making just a job change, career change, lifestyle change, whatever it might be, 
a lot of times the biggest risk is is coming back to what you're doing today, right? So your risk was, oh, if this stuff happens, I'll have to go back and get a different minimum wage job working 30 or 40 hours a week. Like that was the risk, right? So really how big of a risk is that? And I think the other thing important about risk is people think so much about risk because, you know, I heard this on a Ed My Lab podcast, but 70 to 80% of our natural thoughts a lot of times are negative and we're thinking about what might go wrong. The way I encourage people to reframe these risks are, what can you learn from that? What is the confidence you might get from that? So you bought this duplex or these two duplexes. And because of that, I'm guessing that gave you the confidence to accelerate the next acquisitions as well and say, okay, yeah, like you, it helps you understand the real risk or the lack thereof. And the last point on that is, it's interesting to go back to what society was telling you about all the risks and everyone was questioning it, which I wonder if that almost motivated you more to say, I'm going to prove them all wrong or questioning society, as you said earlier. So just a lot of good things in there. Yeah, it, it, it definitely, I mean, there's definitely a, a part about me. It's like, I want to prove to myself and, yeah. you know, um, I think in the early years, yeah, definitely a little bit of a chip on the shoulder of like, I want to go prove to everybody because, because I spoke it, like I spoke it way before I did it. Like I went out and told everybody I'm going to invest in real estate. I'm going to retire young and wealthy. I'm going to be financially free. I mean, when I owned one home, I made business cards that said I'm a real estate investor, which, which is also how I found my second property. Um, and so that's the mindset piece. Like I believed it was, I believed it was possible. And you know, when people look at risk, and I think you're exactly right. Like a lot of times it's the negative stuff. Like, well, what if this, what if this, what if this, well, shit, what if everything goes right? You know? Right. And in those early years, yeah, I had those moments of like, I had no reserves and, you know, I was managing my, in the early years, I was managing my own properties. And there were times like a tenant mo would move out and I didn't have a bunch of capital. I didn't have a bunch of reserves to put into it. And it was like, all right, there's carpet that's 30 years old. And if, you know, pull the carpet up and you're like, all right, that, that wood underneath looks pretty good. And I'd get that thing rented. And it was like, you know, you could get bogged down with like, what if the tenants destroy the place? What if this happened? And there were a lot of moments in those early years of like, okay, like, like, what do I do? It's, it's vacant, but you, you figure it out. And yeah, I think that confidence breeds confidence and, you know, it's, it's just an important muscle that you have to exercise. Yeah, no, I love that a lot. And just, just the, the whole risk topic is important. And we're not, we're not telling people just take crazy risk and be irrational, but we're saying, understand those risks, really put it in perspective. And if those things happen, what will the result of it be? But also make sure you really like, it's just hard to understand the upside at, you know, what is this now? 20 years ago, almost you didn't anticipate having $60 million and you couldn't even picture where you are today because you just started and you took the first steps then. So I love that. And you brought up mindset and I want to go there because I love talking mindset as well. It seems like you were, um, like did the belief in the mindset that you were going to be successful. Was that just, did you, was that naturally natural confidence? Or is that something like you built that muscle? Yeah, it's. I, I actually get asked that quite a bit because um, I think mindset is a really tough thing to teach. And I like my earliest, like my earliest memories. And I credit my my mom for this. And she asked the other day, "Is like, is this the only thing you credit me for?" But no, it's it's something that stuck out in my mind so much. Is like at a very young age, like a lot of parents, you know, oh, you can do anything you put your mind to. But at a young age, like I naively just believed it. Like it was almost like. I mean, they get a really young age. Like, oh, my mom said I can do anything I put my mind <laughs> to, right? Um, I'm like, that that makes sense. But it became a mantra. It became something that that I believed, you know. And and I had a friend recently. He he moved back from Tokyo, and and uh, we were on a walk, and he was like, I remember he was telling me this. I remember being sick, and I remember um, I kept saying I don't feel good. I don't feel good. And I guess I turned to him and said, Yeah, of course you don't feel good because you're literally telling yourself all day how you don't feel good. And I guess I told him, and this is like before I even knew that like mindset was so powerful. And I guess I told him like, Hey, you need to start telling yourself like, you feel great. Your body's healing. You're okay. You're not sick. And he's like, I started doing that. Like, this is like 25 years later. He's remind, you know, reminding me of this. And he's like, I started feeling better. And I'm like, Oh, that's mindset, you know? Yep. Um, and then the, 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 the first time it like really, really manifested in my life was, um, through, you know, high school, high school wrestling. I, I, you know, wrestling was a huge part of my life in high school. I won a state championship my, my senior year, but I didn't start high school. I didn't start wrestling until high school. And, you know, I, I had a coach that, um, you know, told me like, you know, you don't, 
you never want to be on your back. Don't even sleep on your back. So I like took that to heart to the extreme where I didn't sleep on my back until probably my early twenties. Um, it's like all through, all through high school, but you know, by my junior year, I was, I was decent. I qualified for the state tournament, but I was two and out, but I made a decision that year that the following year I'd be a state champion, which is very, which is very un, uh, it's very rare for a, you know, a wrestler that starts in high school to win a state champion st championship. And it's not like I didn't train my ass off because I, I put in the work, but I believed full heartedly 100% in my mind that, that I would. And then I put in the work and took the actions that led to me to that state championship. And I took, and I took real estate investing on the exact same way before I knew how, before I knew what it would take. I believed that I would be successful as a real estate investor. And I believed it. I spoke it just like I did in wrestling. And, and then I made it happen. And I think it's, you know, there, there, there's a fine line between cocky and confident, but like, you have to have that belief in yourself. There is a, there is a level of like not caring, you know, not caring what others think and kind of tying it into real estate and those, that, you know, that, that early deal and tying it back in, you know, into risk. I like on those early deals, I, I also did things to mitigate, to mitigate, you know, the, the risk. So, you know, I, I mentioned before, like I made sure the property was cash flow positive from the beginning. Yep. That, you know, that I, that did not put me in a position where I had to sell the property or raise rents or do any kind of big value add for the deal to, to make sense. These were also non-recourse notes, right? And so worst case scenario, they cash flowed the whole time I owned it. And this never, this never happened, but worst case scenario, if at the end of that seller finance term, or if I were to default on a loan, I would just hand them the house back. Right. The, the, so, the, the house that you didn't put any money into in it, the first place. Right. Exactly. So, is, so again, you, you're able to set up the financing structure there where your risks were really, really, really low. Um, I want to point out, you know, you talked about mindset. I think for you, the mindset, the confidence, the beliefs were generally either pretty natural or just started at a young age. But I want to point out your friend who had the health issues, his mindset wasn't there and you shifted it. And the point there would be to get around people that can help shift your mindset and grow and build it if you're not as strong naturally as Gabriel is. And the other thing is, if you take the first step and you take action, which I want to go to next, because you talk about that in the book, just getting over the hump and doing it. But if you take those first step and you have success there, success breeds confidence and builds mindset, in my opinion. So that, so 100%. you talk about the first step again, it, it seems like maybe why is this, why, why is it, why is this the most important step? I guess, as you say in the book. Yeah, I, I think it's the, the mindset. I think of it like, a lot of us believe or don't believe in the law of attraction, but at least understand law of attraction. But the other part of that is the law of action. So it's like, you know, I, I don't think you need to sit and meditate on health or wealth or whatever. And, and, and it just is going to come to you. But I do think having that strong belief is important because it, it forces you to look at things differently and forces you to think about things differently, but it also forces you to take action differently. But that's the second piece, like yes, law of attraction, but also law of action. So like, you know, think it and dream it and believe it, but then actually take action on those action on those things. It's, it's easy to say like, you know, Hey, I, I would like to be financially free through real estate, or it would be nice. Or wouldn't it be great if I, you know, could find a property that cash flows. That's a very different language and belief than like, I will be financially free. I am a real estate investor. I am going to retire young and retire wealthy, what, what, whatever that language is. Like, I think what we're telling ourselves and ultimately what we take action on does breed a, a a result. And, and I think that works positive or negative. And so it's, you know, it's important to be careful with, with what we say out loud and uh, you know, in our mind to our, to ourselves, but also, you know, to the world. I mean, I think, I think that I've seen that manifest in my life and other people's life, both positive and negative. They hold on to whatever that belief there is. And that is the result of, or what manifests in, in their life, positive or negative. And I think, I mean, the, the language you, you talked about this, but the language you use, like who, who talks to you more than anyone else yourself. So the language you use is so, so important. And if you're using, I would say weak or, you know, not very confident language when you're like, I might, or I wonder, I think versus I will, and this is where I will be and getting clear on that and building habits around that. I think it can be, it will just accelerate things so much. Um, the law of attraction, the law of action, all those things. So Love it. I want to go. So I want to circle back to your story a little bit. So you got started, you kind of took the first step, rich dad, poor dad, all the, you know, risk, all those things you talked about. 
Fast forward to maybe after you started buying these small multifamily deals, what was kind of the next pivot or big shift that you made? Yeah. So, so everything I bought 2009 through 13 was all no money down seller finance. And, and again, the only criteria was they had to be cash flow positive. And I remember thinking, because people would ask like, what if prices go down? And I was like, I, I don't care as long as they're cash flow positive. And, and they were, and in fact, during that time, rents went up, there was less buyers in the buying pool. And so they became renters. I never had, you know, more vacancy or, or rents dip. Um, so that was 2009 through 13. When 2014 rolled around, I went to refinance all these properties. And this was like a big kind of proof of concept moment for me because by then interest rates were down, rents were up, prices started coming back up. And when I went to refi, all these properties, they all appraised out at 70% LTV or better. And I was able to get long-term fixed debt on all these properties that I bought with no money down. And when I'm doing the math going, gosh, the banks want to see 30% equity. And if I would have tried to buy these today, I would have had to come up with 30% down, which yeah. is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, which I didn't have in those, in those early years. And I remember thinking like, cause I refined, I think like 10 or 11 properties at a time, you know, all multifamily. And I remember thinking, Oh my gosh, I, and they're all in the low 4%. And I'm like, I am ending up with long-term fixed at a long-term loan on all these properties. I put no money down on now the cash flow is going up. They all appraised out well, and I'm in the exact same position that someone would be in if they tried to buy these today, but having to bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars down. And that was a big aha moment for me. It was like, wow, this, this, this worked. Um, from, from there, uh, you know, one of those uh, initial uh, original sellers, she became my first uh, private money lender. And it's a very, it was a very interesting story. I had refied or refinanced her out of a couple of properties. And she had said, what am I going to do with all this money? Yep. And I had never borrowed private money before and she had never lent private money. And I said, you can lend it back to me. And, and she kind of laughed and there wasn't much of a conversation after that. A couple months later, I'm in contract on a home in the same neighborhood, uh, not one of her properties. And I was going to get a hard money loan for the first time. And cause I built a relationship with a local, local hard money lender. She called me up and said, Hey, were you serious about me lending you, lending you uh, that money? And I said, yeah, I'm actually in contract on a property, you know, right now. And she said, well, you know, we have six years of trust. You've, you've made payments on time. Like you promised every, every single month, you know, you were a man of your word. You refined and paid me back just like our, um, you know, our contract said, I would love to lend you this money. And she became my first uh, private money lender. So from there, I continued to use private money, hard money and seller financing, um, for a while, mostly in the in the small multifamily space, I moved into some uh, mixed use mixed use properties. Had a couple partnerships, uh, one in particular uh, where we partnered on stuff. You know, he had a construction background, and I would just get properties under contract. You know, fifty cents on the dollar and turn them over to him. Uh, and then, kind of fast forward, like twenty nineteen, I you know I thought you know do I want to get in larger multifamily? But I felt like cap rates and returns were getting condensed down to to nothing. It was very competitive. And so in 2019, I was, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy mobile home parks. And so today I own nine, nine mobile home park, or I guess eight mobile home parks and one RV park campground. And uh, so bought a couple in 2019 um, and just kept, kept buying parks. They kind of fit that early model of poorly managed, under rented, some deferred maintenance and a lot of upside, you know, whether it was, you know, bump up the rents or bill back for utilities. And I, I really like the mobile home park space. I still think there's opportunity there. Although like every asset class that's that they've all been frothy these last, these last, yeah. you know, few years, um, you know, and, and I've hired great property managers and, and that's, you know, hiring management is really allowed me to own my time, which is what's actually important to me is, is my, is my time freedom. I, those early years, I thought it was just financial freedom. I thought it was about being being rich, but when I dug a little deeper, it really came down to I wanted to own my time. And so I've been very strategic with, you know, the deals I take on, what's gonna allow me to have time, you know, whether it's with my family or throughout the day, work out in the middle of the day or travel, whatever it might be. I don't want to get bogged down in all the little things. I, you know, I definitely don't want to manage properties. And so I've hired great property managers. That's allowed me to to own a lot of my time and also just focus on, you know, deals, which is what I, what I'm better at. And honestly, I want to just what focus on deals and what you're best at. You talk about this in the book and you also talk about, but you, you really emphasized relationships. I wrote this down when you had the lady that you seller finance from, and then you bought, you paid off her seller financing 
but you clearly treated her the right way. You showed an interest. You just built that relationship, not even having the intention, of course, of ever paying her off and borrowing that money back. There's no way you could have kind of thought through that when you first did that. Never. Year, yeah. Right? Didn't, it, it didn't even, didn't even cross my mind when I bought that first, that first property, but I always did what I said I was going to do. And we built a great relationship from it. And you really just, I mean, you talk about it, but focusing on relationships, being authentic, being transparent, being vulnerable. Like you talked early about when you started, you were hanging out cards and you were talk, talking to people, but you were also transparent with people of what you know and what you didn't know at the time. So I just think all those things, like it just, that all comes out from the person you're working with that you're just a real person. You're authentic. You're, you know, you're not trying to play tricks on them. You're just, you're just a, a good human being. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I appreciate that. And I think, I think sadly it's, it's what's missed a lot within real estate, I, I guess in, in any business yeah. or maybe, maybe even in life, you know, and um, but I, you know, when I look at, when I look back at every real estate transaction I've done every single deal, and I, I can't say this enough, every single deal from my very first deal, my second deal, my third deal to my last, my most recent deals to deals I'm working on 100% of those deals have come from conversations or relationships a hundred percent of them, you know, and I, you know, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of ways to invest in real estate. There's a lot of ways to, to find deal flow. Um, I think you got to find what kind of works for you. For, for me, I like people. So my network has been built very organically. I, I don't do, you know, any, uh, you know, auto calling or texts or mailing out letters and, and not saying that's wrong. I know a lot of people that have been very successful, uh, with mail campaigns and um, ringless voicemail, so so not not knocking that because that's a, that is a great way to to source deals. That's just not how I've built my network. It's just been through organic organic relationships and and also not being afraid to open my mouth and and tell people what I'm what I'm looking for. Love it. And I want to shit. I also want to talk about because you started. I wanted to, I wanted to hit the relationship topic because I think that's so important, not just in real estate, mm -hmm. in any business, quite frankly, in any area of life. So I wanted to hit on that. But then I want to talk about this owning your time and time freedom. And how, like, so there's these different freedoms. And initially you were thinking about yeah. financial freedom. But to me, really financial freedom is, is a lot about time freedom and having the option to do what you want and making money, like removing money as a factor that's controlling your time. So tell me more about what, what time freedom is to you and um, how you're able to take advantage of that maybe today. Yeah, I, I think, you know, time freedom may look different to different people, but ultimately it comes down to to freedom, you know, freedom of choice, freedom to decide what your day looks like, what your week looks like, what your what your life looks like. And so, you know, what what people choose to do with that time, you know, may may look different, but ultimately it comes down to more choice, doing what you want, when you want, where you want, with who you want. Um you know, and, and the reality is that that is hard to do with, you know, a, a full-time job. It's hard to do. And so in those early years, like I mentioned before, I thought it was all about being wealthy. And, and I remember being on a walk and I remember thinking like, why am I so driven to be financially free? Like, what is it that I actually want? I know, I know I don't want to swim in a pile of money. Like that's not attractive to me. I don't, I, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, need to have a ton of lavish things. Like why, why does it feel so important to me almost like intuitively to just like, you know, build wealth. And, and it came down to like, I don't want people telling me what to do. I don't, you know, I want to show up when I want to show up. I want to work on things when I want to work on things. And, you know, I, I think some of that was my personality at a young age and then being in the military, you know, you, you are being told what to do 24 seven. And I just wanted to, to own my life. I wanted to control how I spent my life. And, whether no, no matter what that, no matter what that looks like, it just came down to more freedom, more choices, you know, and something we talk about in the book, we talk about R1 and it's kind of that first level of retirement. Yep. And it's, it's a concept also that's, you know, in rich dad, poor dad, you know, about replacing your income and it doesn't have to be a large amount of money. That R1, R1 is that first level of retirement. It's replacing your income. And so, that was my number one goal. So, you know, in 2009, I had a very, 30 hours a week minimum wage job. So my goal was to replace that income. And it seemed very um, obtainable because, you know, when you're bringing home like $1,500 a month, it's like, all right, well, if I can replace $1,500 a month, I'm financially free. So right. those first couple duplexes with those other single families, it, it cash flowed almost a dollar I was making at my job. Now I could have kept working, 
So now I would have brought home like $3,000 between the rentals and the job. But I understood the difference of making money and building wealth. So making money, I would keep the job. I would keep showing up at work. And building wealth was like, hey, now I have my time. I can go put more deals together. So at like, you know, I'm in my, by then I'm like in my mid, mid twenties, I'm $1,500 a month cash flow positive, And I'm like, I'm retired. <laughs> I did it. I'm financially free. My expenses were low. My income was low. I'm still poor as shit, but I'm like, I'm financially free. Financially free. Fin that's, the, that's the title of the episode right there. Financially free and poor as shit. Right. Yeah. With that. <laughs> and, I love and, it. And, yeah. But what it allowed me to do, like I had time to go put more deals together. Right. And so I wasn't out there trying to make a ton of money. I was trying to build wealth. I was building wealth slowly through buy and hold cash flow real estate. And and that's really what R1 is. That's what we talk about in the Zero to 100 book and within the Zero to 100 tribe is like, how do you reach that R1? Because once you get to R1, that's in some ways for a lot of people, that is the hardest, especially when people start making real money. So when I yeah. have doctors or attorneys, you know, come to me and they say, hey, I'm making X amount of hundred thousand dollars, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. That is actually harder to replace. It can be done, but usually by that time, they, you know, they've had lifestyle creep, their, their expenses are high. And so that is going to be harder to replace. So I yeah. think for, you know, young investors or, uh, you know, in, investors that are starting out, the sooner you can replace that income, the sooner and easier it is to focus just on real estate. Because once I gave up that job and it's not like it was a, you know, a great career, again, 30 hours a week, minimum wage job. I put, I had time and energy to put more and more deals together that I don't think I would have had I continued working. Yeah. I think, I think not just money, but time, extra time compound can compound so much, especially if you're focused on the right thing and you bring focus to it and you having the focus on making, on building wealth versus making money is important. I want to go back to something you, you talked about, but didn't um, say specifically you were asking yourself a lot of questions when you hit basically R1 or why did you want financial freedom? And I think the the message there, like you said a couple of different times, you were on walks, creating space. And I think the important part here is do the deep work of understanding why, like getting to know why you want what you want, like just really trying to figure yourself out and understanding it because every single, like you might think, okay, I want financial freedom. And all of a sudden you get there. It's like, well, no, I, I didn't want, really want financial freedom. I wanted this, or I didn't really want that, but I want it. it sounded like that evolved over time. It, yeah, it definitely evolved over time. And then, you know, I, I started building a network with other investors and I would have conversations with them or aspiring investors. And it was always about financially freedom. It was always, I want financial freedom. I want X amount of dollars per, per month. And you would dig like only one layer deeper, one layer deeper. And it was yeah. never about the money. It was always more time with my family, yep. more time to travel, more time to give back to this cause where they had elderly parents. Right. And so like, that was my own experience. But then as I started meeting other people, that wanted financial freedom, it was always came down to time freedom. It yep. wasn't about the money. They always wanted to, they want, always wanted to own their time, you know, and, and early, uh, you know, I, I had young kids at the time. Now they're 16 and almost 14, but early on, I really thought time freedom was all about going and just doing cool shit. And there is yeah. an aspect to that. Like, yeah. you know, we've gotten to do some amazing things in, in amazing places with amazing people. And, and I'm grateful for that. But where it, where it kind of came to the next level of appreciation was when my dad passed away a little over six years ago and, you know, I'm able to sit on the couch to, every day, you know, the last two weeks leading up to, to him passing. And I remember thinking for one, I was filled with so much gratitude because my mom, dad, and wife all lost a parent at 12 or 13 years old. And here I am, you know, six years ago at 35 and I'm thinking, gosh, I got 35 years with my dad. So there was definitely a level of appreciation and gratitude there. But I remember thinking like, because I have the time freedom, I can sit here with him every day and just cherish this time. And I don't have to choose or regret. I don't have to make the decision of like, do I go to work or not go to a work? If I like, if I miss work, I don't have enough money to live or get by. And I remember being so grateful and it gave me even a higher level of appreciation for time freedom. And then same thing when my, when my wife's stepdad was, was really sick and before he passed, she could be up there as much as possible. We went there as a family. And, and again, we didn't have to decide between like, gosh, if I miss work, I'm not going to have enough money to pay the bills. And it, it gave me, you know, even just a, I, I guess a, uh, even more vocal voice about how important time freedom is because yeah, there's an aspect about, you know, being able to own your day and go do cool things, but you know, really it gives you time to also be with the people that you love and that are important to you. And, uh, 
I mean, that's there, there's just no, there's no value that you can put on that. No, that's fantastic. And I, I was, I was going to make the point earlier, like financial freedom in and of itself. I think people that are pursuing that it, it, maybe it's a little bit empty sometimes, but there probably is a deeper reason that you're pursuing it. And there's all, there, there might be deeper reasons you pursue it, but then the, the story you just told, there's also even deeper reasons that you don't realize when you're pursuing it, that you'll get out of it. So uh, appreciate you sharing that story very, very much. So I want you to step Absolutely. back and reflect just on your whole story. Like, so just, and then I'll ask you kind of what you're excited about moving forward. But if you just step back and what you've accomplished, how, you know, what you've accomplished, I think the, you know, writing the book, the people you've impacted for sure. How does that make you feel? Gosh, when I, I guess when I, when I look back, I, I just want to continue to evolve in the, the most authentic version myself. And, you know, I, I don't always know what that's going to look like. Um, you know, I, I heard someone say once, uh, David Osborne, who I'm sure, you know, um, we had a little fireside chat years ago at, at one of his houses. And he said, if you're not slightly embarrassed by who you were 10 years ago, you're not growing. And, and, and I think about that. I think about that, that often, cause it's had a lot, that's had a big impact because it's, um, I, I want to continue to be a better version of myself. And, and whether that's a, a better father, a better husband, a, b a better investor, like whatever it might be. Um, I think it's important to have that growth mindset. I never think I know it all. I never think I'm too good. Uh, I always, I I'm always eager to, to learn and, and grow. And so it's, there's, there's a level of appreciation. Like I am thankful that I am where I am today and I'm thankful for the decisions I've made and I don't live a life of regret. I should have done this, could have done this. Um, but I'm also, I'm excited where I'm at, but I'm also excited to, you know, where I'm going. And, and I don't know what that, you know, what that, what that looks like, but I am, you know, focused on growth in all areas of my life. And I, you know, if, if I'm not growing, I, I feel like I'm dying. The last two minutes is ab absolutely fantastic. And I do um, just rewind that, listen to that again, because just becoming the best version of yourself, enjoying that journey, I think reflecting back in the 10 years and maybe you're embarrassed about it, but you also, if you do, if you go through that exercise, you're probably, you probably have some gratitude about where you are today because of the comparison, but it also, I mean, 10 years is a long time. So if you think about like, you're listening to this podcast thinking, how the heck can I be like Gabriel Hamill? But I'm sure he didn't think he could be where he is 10 years from now. And then the, the law of compounding, where is Gabriel going to be in 10 years from now is just remarkable to even think about. I can't even, I can't even imagine. So what are you excited about right now? Like what's, what's, what kind of gets you fired up or energized? God, I mean, I mean, right now I'm just really enjoying a lot of family time. I mean, you know, I, I, it's like, I will continue to invest in real estate. That's fun. I, I love building relationships, but you know, it's like my wife, the relationship with my wife and my two kids, like that brings me a lot of joy. I'm very intentional with my time. We, we just spent a, a week in Maui, me and my wife and kids, um, you know, and then I was in Austin for a real estate mastermind and Dallas for a, a go abundance pod meetup. And then my wife and I went to a private Island in Panama with some, uh, with some other amazing couples. And so it's, I, I really try to fill my life with, you know, intentional family time intentional, intentional friend time. But I also, I also really enjoy just like the taking my kids to school and right. going to their soccer games and listening to them play guitar. Like it's, I enjoy, like, I like going off and doing cool things. And I also enjoy, just the little things in life, because I think life is made up of all those little things. Just like you said, compounding, you know, whether it's your wealth or your health or your time spent with people, like all of that, all of that time compounds as well. Um, so I, I, I guess, I guess that's a long winded answer. I'm, I'm excited awesome. about life, life in general. I, you know, when I think about what brings me the most joy, like gratitude, gratitude is really what allows me to live a, you know, a happy, appreciative life. Fantastic. Fantastic. I want, I want to ask about your key factors to success. You've probably talked about some, but if you were to say one thing, like this was the key factor to my success, how, how would you answer that? Trust in your gut, trust in your gut and going, going for what you believe in. And what, what do you, and it, I guess that's what's gotten you here. Is that what gets you there? Is that what gets you to the next phase as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think there's what got me here isn't necessarily what's going to take me to that next level. You know, I think there's multiple mountains in life. So, uh, you know, and, and, and I have big goals. So it's, 
I, I do believe what got me here isn't what's going to get me that, that that next level. At the same time, it is going to come down to you know trusting my gut and taking action on those things that I that I believe in, creating that big vision, and then taking action towards those goals. What is the most real, most impactful business or real estate book that you've read? Oh gosh, the most impactful. I mean, it's hard not to say. It's hard not not to say Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, if you weren't to say it, what would you say? <laughs> if I, uh, zero to 100 units. No, uh -huh. um, uh, gosh, all those early rich dad books, like the retire young, retire rich cash flow quadrant. Those the did have a big book. impact. Yeah. yeah those, those had a big impact. I think, you know, kind of non-business, but also business, like how to win friends and influence people, mm -hmm. uh, was a big one. I think, I think the title's a little misleading it. I felt like it came across of like how to trick people. And it really came down to like, how to treat people right and listen. Yeah. Um, that was a big one. Um, yeah, that, that's probably some of the most impactful. I love it. Uh, we're, we're getting close on time here, but this has been just so many nuggets throughout the, the, the podcast, both real estate specific, but really there's just the mindset, the belief system, the you know relationships, so many different things that can apply to success in real estate and other business and quite frankly, other areas of life. So I appreciate that. Um, on the video, I'm showing a book here. So tell us more about how people can find out more about you, the book. And I think even maybe you talked about offering um, our listeners a gift of some sort. Yeah. So the book zero to 100 units uh, written by uh, Travis Dillard, Mitch England and myself. So zero to 100 is a free online community for real estate investors or those looking to uh, learn about real estate investing. It is not a tribe of flippers or wholesalers or land bankers. This is specific to those that want to buy and hold cash flow real estate. Um, you know, we we teach and you know, not just mindset, but also how do how do you get a hundred plus units? How to buy and hold a hundred plus cash flowing units? Uh, we have a mastermind within that group, and we'll yeah zero to one hundred tribe dot com. Uh, we'll get you a lot of information and we'll make sure, you know, put a link on the show notes and, yep. you know, happy to offer a, a digital download um, to all your listeners as well. Awesome. I appreciate that. And yeah, I, just, just for the listeners, I mean, I was reading the book, it's just a really, like, it's a very specific, Hey, we're going to get you from zero to 100 units in three years. And this is very specifically how you can do it. Not, not there's a million different ways to do this. This is a specific plan that you can put in place to do it. So I really encourage people that are, trying to build a real estate portfolio to check it out. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I'll, I'll say too, I'll add real quick, you know, a lot of people get into real estate, right? For that financial freedom or time freedom that we've talked a, a lot about on the show. And oftentimes they end up getting in the real estate world and building businesses that don't actually align with those things. So a lot of this book, a lot of the zero to 100 tribe, we talk about time freedom because I've watched a lot of people, you know, they start a broker, they start a property management company, they start all flipping, they start all these things within real estate to escape their W2 or to get out of that rat race. And now all of a sudden they're working three, four times as much, four times as hard. And they actually are farther away from time freedom. They're farther away from building, building the life they want. So we really want to help people not only become financially free, but also have that time freedom so they can go enjoy life and all those things. Uh, uh, which is why they got into real estate investing in the first place. I love it because you just, yeah, making sure people stay focused on the priorities. Gabriel, this has been amazing. I really appreciate it. Uh, for the listeners, make sure you check out, we'll put that in the show notes, but zero to 100 tribe.com. We'll, we'll get a, you set up on a free gift again. Thank you for the time today. We were very grateful for the more real estate and business podcast signing off. Thank you for listening to the More Real Estate and Business Podcast. We hope you found today's episode helpful. If you know current or aspiring investors or entrepreneurs or anyone that would benefit from today's episode, we appreciate you sharing it with them or better yet, providing us a five-star review. To learn more about Molar Real Estate, visit our website at www.molarre.com. You can also sign up for our newsletter or local events via our website. In closing, I encourage you to be purposeful in all areas areas of life, educate yourself, network with others that have been successful, take action and lead. Thank you.